Minister. <coughs> uh, this is Morris Nightingale. I'm one of the leaders at your sister church down the road in Ipswich and also part of the apostolic team for our family of churches, Relational Mission. And uh, it's my pleasure to be invited today to uh, speak to you this morning. I'm going to be speaking from a uh, passage in the Bible uh, from Zechariah, uh, chapter 8. Zechariah has always been a very important uh, uh, letter for me personally. So an account of some prophecies brought by a prophet uh, back in uh, the days of Israel before Jesus had uh, come. <clears throat> And uh, I found it really immensely helpful. Um, I think getting to grips with the messages uh, from passages such as Zechariah, Isaiah, what we would call the Restoration uh, Scriptures, which speak of God's dreams for his people, the big picture story, the big picture narrative for the people of God. I've always found that immensely helpful. It was a big turning point for me, I think, when I grabbed hold and managed to start to grasp this, you know, from the sense of always being uh, conscious of your, your own um, frailties and uh, shortcomings or, or, or being uh, a bit overwhelmed by the circumstances uh, of the world that we live in, which is very much the case for all of us at the moment. It's been an extraordinary year that we've lived through. Um, catching a glimpse of... God's breathtaking dreams for his people, uh, for our destiny, uh, the bigger picture, stepping back a little bit and thinking, right, what is going on here? You know, um, <clears throat> despite what my personal experience is at the moment, despite the circumstances of the world that I live in, there is a, there is a bigger narrative being played out here. And uh, when we read some of these scriptures, we get a glimpse of this and it's absolutely thrilling. And so for me, it was life changing. Uh, getting uh, my hands on, on on some of these big things and understanding where where you know everything fits in. It's not all about me. It's not all about my little issues. You know, it's not all about uh, you know God has 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 come to to uh, make my life. No, no, He saved me to be part of His great cause, to make His name great and to have a people for Himself and. Um, I am uh, always excited to unpack these scriptures. So we're going to do that together. We're going to look at uh, <clears throat> Zechariah 8 over the next 20 minutes or so. So please uh, grab your Bibles. I'll be reading from the first nine verses very soon. I mean, Zechariah, his name actually means the Lord remembers. Uh, so even in his name, there's a sense of understanding that God is remembering what this is all about. Yeah, as we as we are sort of pushing our way through historic events or life events or personal circumstances, God remembers the what He's doing here. He's not diverted or distracted, you know, from the big story, the big picture that He is going to redeem for Himself a family from every tongue, tribe, and nation, and we're going to be one new nation in Christ. This is the big picture, and these scriptures point to that. <clears throat> Uh, we, we often refer to uh, some of these uh, prophecies and so on as restoration scriptures. They, they point to the restoration of the fortunes of the people of God. Um, we need to look at, you know, understand how we uh, evaluate and interpret these scriptures. Obviously, when Zechariah was first uttering these prophecies, they were meant for um, his immediate hearers, there would have been a, a relevance and an application for the people who heard what Zechariah was prophesying. And they're thinking, you know, this is what God is saying about us and about our situation. There's, so that's one layer of, of, of uh, application. There's another layer of application of what it means for the ethnic people of Israel. You know, there's obviously a glorious future for Israel when she repents and turns to Jesus Christ as their Messiah. The Bible is clear about this. And so Zechariah is pointing to some uh, things uh, that God has in his heart for the ethnic people of Israel. But overarching all of that is the fact that, uh, you know, by faith, <clears throat> um, we are all sons and daughters of Abraham. You know, we, uh, described in the Bible as Gentile believers, so not Jewish, but Gentile, engrafted, we get included. We inherit all the promises as spiritual Israel that God has made. Um, to Abraham and his descendants and uh, we are the, the seed of Abraham by faith uh, is how the Bible describes it and we are 
uh, no longer aliens or foreigners. We are uh, fellow citizens with God's people, co-heirs of the promises. So there's an application of these scriptures for the church of today and the church of all ages. Uh, this is what God has in his mind for his people. And uh, it's always thrilling to uh, be able to read these things and understand that for our situation. So here you are, sat there, watching this. God is speaking to you about his big dreams and uh, his, his end time purposes that he will redeem for himself, gather for himself uh, a people, a family. I wonder if sometimes, uh, you know, we don't reflect on that enough. What a wonderful thing it is to be part of the family of God. And once we were alone, you know, God takes a lonely and he puts them in family. Once we were cut off, once we were abandoned, once we were far from him, and now he has given us the right to be called the children of God through Jesus Christ. You know, we rebelled against him, we went our own way, and he has, in his mercy, reached out to us and said, if we would just turn from our rebellious ways and put our trust and confidence in Jesus Christ and in his perfect obedience, that God will deliver us, save us, redeem us, buy us back, adopt us with the full rights of sonship as uh, sons and daughters of, of God. I mean, it's a, it's a glorious gospel. And, uh, you know, just the, the thrill of being part of, you know, once we were no people, now we are the people of God. What a, what a thrilling thing it is. I think uh, reading these scriptures, <clears throat> it ignites something of, of this. For me personally, it ignited something. that I wasn't just sort of plowing my own lonely furrow, doing my own thing, but I'm part of the most wonderful, glorious, significant purposes in the history of mankind to uh, establish the purposes of God in our day, see his kingdom come and, uh, and see his people raised up as a sort of a, a model to the world of this is what it's like if we live according to the ways of God. It, it's, it's good for us and uh, God's ways are good and God is good. So God has a dream. Um, <clears throat> every statement of, of, of vision statement or mission statement that any church has is a reflection of God's own vision and mission for his own purposes and his own name and his own glory. You know, even when, uh, you know, Martin Luther King famously declared, you know, I have a dream. He was repeating the dreams of God, that there would be one new man from every nation, every uh, creed and color and culture together with one king. This was, this is the dream of God. And we get an insight into these dreams <clears throat> as we read through these verses in Zechariah 8. I'm just going to read the first uh, nine verses and then we'll just uh, unpack a little bit of some of these things that uh, are in God's heart for his people. So here we go. <clears throat> um, the title in, I'm reading from the ESV and the subtitle is The Coming Peace and Prosperity of Zion, of the people of God. So the word of the Lord of hosts came saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Zion with great jealousy and I am jealous for her with great wrath. Thus says the Lord, I have returned to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with staff in hand because of great age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. Thus says the Lord of hosts, if it is marvellous in the sight of the remnant of this people in those days, should it also be marvellous in my sight, declares the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them to dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in faithfulness and in righteousness. And thus says the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong. You who in these days have been hearing these words from the mouth of the prophets who were present on the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. So this is wonderful. Let's just uh, unpack this. First of all, verse two, uh, verse 2, the Lord Almighty says, I'm very jealous for Zion. I'm burning with jealousy for her. 
Um, you know, we can, especially in in, in troubling times uh, that we've lived through this year, we can sometimes wonder. You know, is God interested? You know, is he is he with us? He just seems so far away. You know, he doesn't seem to be speaking. He doesn't seem to be acting. Um, well, we must align ourselves around what is true and what is spoken and what is said in the Word of God and not allow circumstances or you know, our emotional responses to uh, condition what is true. What is true is God is very jealous for his people. He loves his family. We are the people of, of God and he is passionate for his church. <clears throat> and uh, I want to, this is what sort of changed uh, the scene for me. I'm thinking if this is what God thinks, I want to think like God. I don't want to think differently to God. And some people can get a bit disaffected with the church. They can think, well, you know, there's so much hypocrisy and blah, 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 blah. Well, for sure, it's not uh, it's not perfect, but it's it's God's people. God loves his people. And I'm thinking, God, I want to be as passionate about your people as you are, about your church, about your household, about the uh, demonstration of a model uh, society that we have the opportunity to create through the church. He's not aloof and disinterested. He is, I mean, elsewhere in, Ze in Zechariah, it speaks about him being red, his face being red with passion. He can't contain himself. He's deeply concerned. You know, we can look around and think, well, um, why doesn't God do something? Well, he's done everything. God has done everything he needs to do. Okay, we've, we've got to understand the scenario. We... Uh, the the world is broken because of our sin and because of our rebellion. Because mankind has sinned and rebelled against God, there have been consequences. The world has been frustrated. Uh, we're under a curse of sin and death. Uh, we're under uh, you know a curse of decay, and that's a direct consequence. It's a moral reason. It's the direct consequence of sin, and that's important because the solution. The, the the pathway out is is a moral solution and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ it's not better politics or better ideology or better education or better sociology none of these things are going to fix this problem the only thing that can fix this problem is uh, repentance by faith and trust and confidence in Jesus Christ as our saviour because the reason things are broken is because of sin and the, uh, the the solution to sin is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the answer. So God has done everything he needs to do. He has created the way out for every person, the way out of this place. We're not, this isn't our, this isn't our world. We've been saved out of this world. Um, we're in this world, but not of the world, the Bible says. You know, For those who have put their faith and confidence in Jesus Christ, who have turned away from their rebellious ways, who said, no, I'm going to live uh, God's way now and receive his forgiveness and receive his mercy and his grace and his love that can only come through Jesus Christ, then we, in a sense, we don't belong here anymore. We've been sent back here to uh, represent this beautiful good news. And so we can stand back a little bit from the chaos around us. We can stand back from all of the uh, circumstances and think, you know what, I'm here as part of the pathway, as a signpost to the pathway out of here for people. And um, God hasn't abandoned. God hasn't walked away. He has acted. He is here. He is acting. He's not passive. The Psalms are a great model to us of... Um, of lament in in perplexing circumstances, but then turning our direction uh, to God in confidence. You know, you often read the psalmist. You know, he starts off having a good old moan about things, and you know, and frustration, even anger, disappointment, um, but always turning his gaze confidence to God. And say yes, but God, you know you are good, and your ways are good, and and you will deliver me from this, and I'm confident in you. So, you know, if you're facing lamentable circumstances at the moment, and I'm not pretending that everything is okay, you know, some of us are facing physical um, challenges, emotional challenges, mental health issues, um, uh, but. You know, we've got a God in which we can put our confidence, who is jealous for you and jealous for us and passionate 
to uh, to act and has acted and has created for us the pathway of redemption and is our comfort and is with us to the ends of the age and he will deliver us to real life which is our eternal destiny with him and uh, let's uh, take our lament to God and appeal to his confidence and then uh, send ourselves into a broken world with with messages of hope um, and be jealous for God's purposes through his people as he is. So he then goes on and says, you know, I'm going to return and dwell in, in Jerusalem. He's, you know, we are the holy city. You read of it in Revelation. You know, John sees this vision of a city coming down, made it, you know, uh, gold and all sorts of beautiful gems. You know, this is us, you know, the people of God. You know, look at what God is doing in each one of us as the living stones of his dwelling place. And um, it's a faithful city. It's a city made up of people who are faithful to the ways of God. You know, so that the word of God is so important to us in calling us to faithfulness, in showing us what it means to live a life that is faithful to God. If you want to know what it means to live faithfully to God, he's given us his word in, in the Bible. And um, that's why the Bible for us is, is the final say on anything. You know, it's um, uh, nothing that God will call us to do will contradict his word. And um, and we are a faithful city because we are building ourselves around uh, the very word of God. And um, and he said, well, I want, to, I want to take up residence there. I'm going to live there. This is what marks us out as the people of God. The presence of God marks us out as the people of God. Under the old covenant, what marked out the people of God was the law, temple, uh, observance, um, these sort of there were some physical marks as well, um, and that's what said. So, well, that's what how you know these people are the people of God. How do you know? It's because they've got um, these uh, laws and instructions, and there's uh, these festivals and um, temple uh, worship and observance. Well, under the new covenant, we have a different set of marks. Those marks no longer mark us out as the people of God. It's all been fulfilled in Jesus. And what marks us out as the people of God is the Spirit of God. You know, Peter says at Pentecost, he says, Look, if you repent and believe, you will receive the promised gift, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit dwells in us, enlivens us. And uh, not just us individually, but us as a, as a, as a family as well. So we, we love to gather because the presence of God manifests himself in a unique way as the, the body of Christ gathers. So even though it's difficult at the moment, even though there are challenges, even though there are limitations, man, what a privilege. You know, many people, they can't go to their church. For some people, it's the, the football stadium. For some people, it's the nightclub. You know, whatever it is that is their church for them, at the moment, they're not able to gather. We have this privilege. We have this concession. Praise God that we're still able to gather, even with limitations, but it's so precious to gather, and the, as living stones, we, you know, we are the place where God likes to dwell by his spirit, he loves to come among us, and that marks us out as the people of God, that's what makes us unique, and uh, that's what, uh, we're, we're, we're so like earthenware vessels with treasure within, but this is God's dream, okay, it's God's dream that he will dwell with his people, that he's not a, at a distance, he's going to be with us, he is already with us by his spirit. We're already living in uh, the, the sort of the foretaste of that. And then when uh, in eternity uh, we're with him forever, we're going to understand what it means to have God living with us, walking with us, like Adam walked with God in the cool of the evening. What an astonishing thing that will be. But this is his dream. This is God's dream. His dream is to have a people that he can live with and take up residence with us. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. And then it goes on to say, look, you know, men and women, uh, old men and women will sit in the streets, children will play. What does that mean? It's, it's a, that's a metaphor of a peaceful, secure, just society. This is God's dream. You know, we look around us and society is not peaceful. It's not secure. It's not safe. It's not always just. 
And, um, <clears throat> you know, we, we lament that, correctly so. And God's saying, yeah, well, my dream is that society, all sorrow and suffering will be removed, you know, wipe away every tear. There'll be no injustice. There'll be no insecurity. It's a safe place where old people can um, sit out in the streets and, and children can play safely. Whenever there's any sort of dysfunction or breakdown in, in society, it's, it's the old and the young that tend to suffer first and the infirm, you know. So this is a metaphor to us that God's dream is of a just and safe society. That's what he wants. And we have the opportunity to model that as we build this church here in Colchester, every church, wherever it gathers in the name of Jesus. We're, tr we're trying to say, look, if we do it God's way, we are building a model of this inclusive, safe, secure, just society. It's just a, it's a glimpse of what is to come. You know, that's what God wants. He doesn't want conflict. He doesn't want all of this. Um, all of this devastation and disruption, all of this, um, you know, diminishing of society life by evil or war or poverty or abuse or famine or any other kind of suffering is not God's uh, dream for us. It's the consequence of, of our rebellion. And we have to take responsibility for that. You know, so uh, did God send the virus? Did the devil send the virus? Well, either way, you know, I'm not going to get into that. The fact is, the world is broken because of our rebellion. And there are consequences for that rebellion. Um, and we have to live through, you know, those of us who are saved, we're not of this world, but nevertheless, we still have to live through these consequences with the rest of our race. And uh, But we know that, you know, that this isn't the end of the story for us because we're living with this big picture. But God's dream is of a just and safe society. And we have the opportunity to start to model that and embody that between us, making sure that everybody's included, making sure that everybody has, um, you know, equal voice. Everybody is cared for, that the, the most vulnerable are, we particularly look out for them. You know, Paul says you know, the, 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 those sort of slightly, the, the modest or unpresentable parts of the body, we take particular care of that, you know, the, the, not just the presentable parts. We take, we take care of the, you know, the... The, he, he says the unpresentable parts, but you know those parts that are suffering or struggling. Or, you know, it's not not where we take particular care because we're modelling God's dream of a just society, safe and secure, where old men and women can sit out in the streets and kids can play and no one's fearful or uh, or unsafe. And, and God goes on in verse six. He says, you know, does this sound too good to be true? Um, it's quite an interesting verse. You can read it in two ways. You know, it, it, it may seem marvellous to you. It, would it seem marvellous to me? Um, you could read that as, well, you know, this might seem too good to be true, but it's not a problem to me. You know, it might seem marvellous and amazing to you, but to me, no problem. Um, it's This is where we're going. This is going to happen. You can read it in that way, or you can read it in another way and say, does that seem amazing to you? Well, it seems amazing to me as well. You know, this, um, you may think, look at that and think, that's too good to be true. A safe society, you know, God dwelling with his people, uh, you know, uh, this sense of imminence, not distance. You think that's too good to be true. And it's amazing. And God's saying, yeah, it's amazing. It's my dream. It's what I long for. It's what I love, you know. Um, but it, it, he says it again and again, that we would be as his church, as his gathered people, as his family, we would be a model community to the community around us. We read this again and again in Ezra. You know, we've been set at the centre of the nations. Uh, he repeats it again in Psalm 96. He's set his people in the centre of all nations, not because of size or age or economic might or privileged background, but because of God's grace alone. We are the people that God promised to Abraham, the new Israel, uh, the, 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 you know, beyond number, like the stars in the sky from every tongue, tribe and nation. We are part of God's dream. Uh, his new nation, uh, a model to all nations. The holy mountain that will be raised up above all mountains. That's us. And I'm, my prayer is, as I'm just speaking out these uh, words, is that some of you, your heart is getting gripped, thinking, God... What an amazing thing to be part of your big dream. You know, this isn't just about, you know, how, how's God going to help me with my little issues. It's no, I've been enlisted 
to be part of delivering God's ambitions and building something that is a model to the world of, of, of how society should work. And what a thrilling privilege that is. And so in verse 7, God talks about saving people from countries to the east and the west, bringing them all back, gathering in people. He's going to deliver people from captivity. You know, what does it mean for us? It, this is in gathering of, of from all nations to the nation of God. He's going to bring people from from everywhere, every tongue, tribe and nation, every colour and creed and culture. He's going to bring them in and he's going to have one nation, one kingdom with one king, Jesus, the most beautiful, just king. You know, we often say, you know, that uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Not with Jesus. Jesus is the incorruptible one. There is no one better in all history, to lead our nation than Jesus. By far, you know, I mean, it always seems like a blasphemy to suggest that, that, that he's on a scale, you know. No, he's, he's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. There, you know, it is, there's no better society for us than to be in a kingdom with Jesus as our King. And so God is going to gather people from every, this is his jubilee dream, to deliver people from captivity, um, deliver us from all the things that held us captive, our fears, our sins, situations that perplex us, will be delivered from this. Uh, d- uh, you know, people delivered from unfruitful destinies, unfruitful churches, unfruitful situations, gathered to places where they can grow in, in maturity and fulfil their potential in God, delivered from needy, broken cultures and nations. They, they, they can be uh, built up and sent back to be agents of change in their own nations and cultures. He's going to liberate and restore the nations and gather them to himself. And he is, through his church, he is demonstrating his manifold wisdom to the powers and principalities. And he is building up uh, his dream community. This is the big picture of God. And God says, you know, in verse 9, he says, look, you know, let your hands be strong so that the temple may be built. You know, folks, this is our invitation. Come on, let's give ourselves to this. Let's push beyond just our own individual circumstances and needs and think, no, why, why am I here? I'm here to fulfill the dreams of God. What, what, what are the dreams of God? What is the cause of God? That is that he would have for himself a people from every tongue, tribe and nation. And we're building an outpost of this here in Colchester. We're modelling something of uh, showing that we, God loves his people, he's passionate about his people, so are we. We love his people, we're passionate about his people. God wants to dwell with us by his presence. Well, we're practising, we have the opportunity to experience that every time we gather, where two or three gather, I'm with you. You know, we have the personal indwelling of the Spirit and then when we gather together, he says, I'm going to be with you. And, uh, you know, we have this uh, beautiful privilege of just enjoying the weight of his presence the weight of his glory the weight of his wonder whenever we gather together when the people of god gather together god visits our town or our city in a unique way his presence goes with us and he's looking uh, to build a uh, his 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 perfect dream society we're not going to be perfect this side of heaven you and i know that but this is, our, this is what we aspire to. We say, well, let's, let's move as far as well as we know how. Let's look to establish that among us here, where it's a community of peace. It's not a community of conflict. It's a community of selflessness, not selfishness. It's a community of wanting the best for each other, not just grabbing the best for ourselves. It's a community where the most vulnerable are cared for as best we know how. You know, this is what, you know, this is the metaphor of the peace and the justice that is ahead of us uh, and that we're going to be delivered into in God's heavenly community, his heavenly people. And that he's looking to gather people from every culture and context. So God bless you. If you're sat in this room listening to me speak and you feel a little bit out of place, uh, you think, well, crumbs, these people are quite different to me. Well, you're in the you're, you know, you're in the right place. God wants you to be built in. Not that you've got to change and be like everybody else, but that we will create a model of what it means to 
uh, learn to embrace one another in all our beautiful various cultural expressions um, and uh, to rejoice and celebrate that and enjoy the richness of that because that's our destiny. That's where we're going. That's where we're heading. We are one race. You've heard that a lot recently. There is only one race. It's the human race. And uh, it's uh, God's dream that there will be gathered from every tongue, tribe and nation, this, this beautiful, peaceable, just society. And we are trying to model that as we uh, build our church around the, uh, you know, faithfully around the word of God and enjoying his presence. And so I uh, just want to encourage you in these days, you know, let your hands be strong. Help us build this. OK, these are trying days, they're troubling days. Um, but uh, sometimes you just need to step back and think, what is the big picture? Well, the big picture is that God has a dream and his dream is that he is gathering for himself a family. And what an honour and privilege it is to be part of the people of God, the right to be called his children, to be adopted into his family, and that we together can celebrate this and build this and invite many others to join and say, look, this is... Uh, a foretaste of peaceable, just society where everybody is included and embraced uh, of all circumstances and of all cultures and of all backgrounds and we're going to build something beautiful here because this is God's big dream and this is the future that lies ahead for us. So God bless you all. Thank you for listening. Um, I hope that has given you a little lift, a bit of a thrill just to understand what it is that... Uh, uh, God is is passionate about at this time and um, you know we may struggle to see uh, for ourselves individually and even in our immediate circumstances we may struggle to see outcomes and solutions for situations that we face but just stand back a little bit and just say hey you know God has delivered me from this and uh, I'm part of God's big dream uh, and this is a foretaste of what is ours for eternity and uh, I pray that uh, for many, many years, you'll be thrilled to be involved in investing in this, in the dreams of God in Colchester and in regions and nations beyond. So God bless you all. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye now.